Uh, my name is Michael Collins and I'm the Director General of the Institute of International and European Affairs and I'm very pleased to welcome you all this afternoon to this IIEA webinar and we're absolutely delighted to be joined uh, today this afternoon by Patrick Flynn, uh, Vice President of Sustainability for Salesforce and Patrick is going to speak to us about the adaptation of business models to achieve uh, sustainability goals. Uh, Patrick has been really very good to join us to take time out of his schedule as I say to speak to us particularly given the early hour of the morning in California where he's just told me the sun hasn't even come up yet so um, thank you all the more for joining us in these circumstances but in any event Patrick will speak to us for as usual for about 15 to 20 minutes and then we will go to Q&A with you our audience and you'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom which I think you're all very familiar with at this stage and which you should see on your screen. Uh, please feel free to send your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you, and we will come to them once Patrick has finished his presentation. A, a, a reminder that today's presentation and questions and answer are both on the record, and please feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. Patrick, as I said, who, as I said, is Vice President of Sustainability for Salesforce, which is a global leader in the customer relationship management of one of the fastest growing software companies in the world. And at Salesforce, Patrick defines and leads its environmental strategy. Uh, prior to this role, he has had important roles in green building design, venture capital, and sustainability for a data center co-location company. Patrick holds a, an MBA uh, from MIT, as well as a BS in engineering from Stanford University. So Patrick, K. Minifolgia, 100,000 welcomes. You're very welcome to Ireland. Uh, nice to see you. Good morning to you in California, and thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Top of the morning to you as well. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, thanks, thank you, Michael. Thank you to the IIEA. Um, really such an honor and such a pleasure to be here with you. Um, I'll, I'll begin trying to share my screen here. Just confirm I'm doing that properly, please, um, and that you can see it. Um, the, uh, I just, uh, again, I, I, I wanna start with a sense of gratitude. Um, I, I'm, I'm honored that, that I'm even eligible to be speaking with, with you all. Uh, I will plan to, as Michael said, set about 15 or 20 minutes of context um, both the global context as well as zooming in on the corporate context with a specific lens on what Salesforce is doing in sustainability. And then I'm most looking forward to the Q&A session at the end. So please, as Michael said, um, keep the questions coming in. I'm really eager to have a dialogue and, and understand any way that I can help you or illuminate why we do what we do, offer some advice and learn from each other. Again, beginning with thank you. Um, it's, it, I have to pinch myself that I get to, to speak in, in situations like this. Um, really, in truly such an honor. Let's start by zooming way out. Um, this, the, the global context setting part of a conversation like this, I think, is necessary. There's no way to solve global challenges without taking a moment to zoom out and take a truly global view. And um, some of what I'll share here at the beginning section will not be new to anybody, but I think it helps us all enter into the right mindset. Um, we are on a rock in the middle of space. And on the starriest night that you can picture, you were only looking at about one one hundred millionth of the stars in our galaxy alone and there are a hundred billion galaxies out there. And yet, in spite of all of that vastness, we have no indication that there's any life anywhere but on this little speck. And what an interesting time to be on this lifeboat in the middle of the darkness with a global pandemic, an economic crisis, and the climate crisis uh, looming. Meanwhile, we also have a social and inequality crisis and a crisis of leadership. 
of the 110 billion or so human souls who have ever lived, you and I happen to be here today, alive, conscious, privileged, and able to take part in trying to reshape the future for all life as we know it anywhere in the universe from here on out. We've got a lot of great work to do together. Now, we also have a pretty good roadmap. The, the Sustainable Development Goals, our collective species-wide to-do list for the coming decade. And um, the objectives are quite clear, 169 underlying metrics behind these 17 SDGs. And yet, if we examine them, one of those initiatives stands out above every other, and that is the climate crisis. Um, it is the number one risk in terms of impact and number two in terms of likelihood on the World Economic Forum's annual global risks report. Of the 169 metrics that underlie those 17 SDGs, 154 are linked to climate action. And that's an imp important distinction. Climate action is not just about the environment. Climate change and taking, taking part to address climate change is a way to address inequality, a way to spur on the economy, a way to create human health and well being, a way to support biodiversity, and yes, a way to deliver um, action against the, claim, the changing climate that we see around us. And we're not doing a very good job yet. Um, current, currently, we are on track for a 3.2 degree rise in temperature Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Um, every scientist out there would tell you that that is not a scenario that we want to see happen. And so it's up to us in this critical moment in history to try to reshape things. As Ban Ki-moon said, climate change is the single greatest threat to a sustainable future. But at the same time, addressing the climate challenge presents a golden opportunity to promote prosperity, security, and a brighter future for all. So again, let's zoom in a little bit on how we're doing on that. And you can see current policies here in the light blue place us into a 2.8 to 3.2 degree future. Um, optimistic pledges, and policies place us a little bit better, but we need a lot of more work to get to a two, and a, two degree or ideally a 1.5 degree future. Let me share with you a bit of an animation here that puts it a little bit into context. If we had started declining emissions back in the year 2000, it would have taken only a 3% decline in order to achieve a 1.5 degree future, 3% decline in annual global emissions. But emissions kept rising, we kept deteriorating our available climate budget, and now we require about a 15% annual decline in global CO2 emissions to achieve that 1.5 degree pathway. A rule of thumb way to think about it is a 50% decline in annual global emissions by 2030, having those emissions again by 2040, and reaching net zero emissions by the mid-century. And we know leaders need to move much faster. If we think about climate change sinks of CO2 emissions, I find this diagram from Drawdown quite powerful. We have in the center the atmosphere. On the left-hand side, the various sources of emissions from electricity production, which gets a lot of focus, but also food, agriculture, and land use, industry, transportation, buildings, and other sources. We need to reduce the sources of greenhouse gas emissions as quickly as possible across the board. Those sources are generating more heat trapping gases than the sinks can capture and sequester. The two main sinks that we have doing great work year in, year out are our land-based sinks and ocean-based sinks here on the right-hand side of the diagram. 
we also need to protect, support, and create even more sinks in order to draw down carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as well. We are at a all of the above time for climate action, reducing sources, enhancing sinks, building partnerships in order to create that 1.5 degree future that we all want and that we all will share. Now, what's the role of a company in addressing sustainability writ large and in particular addressing climate change? Well, let's break down a company into some of the fundamental things that it does. It makes products or provides services. And depending on the industry it's in, there are levers, opportunities to create change to either reduce sources of emissions or enhance sinks. There's also the dimension in the center here of how that company operates. Um, everything from what it purchases in its supply chain, how it invests, what its philanthropic um, portfolio looks like, and plenty of levers there, particularly for um, reducing emissions if we zoom in on how it operates and where it operates. And then a very important lever right now, especially with regards to creating systemic change, is what a company stands for, what it communicates, what it says to and asks of other stakeholders around it. And as we move forward through this presentation, I'll zoom in on that a little bit with regards to Salesforce. Um, we are a company that is motivated by our values. Um, our values are trust, customer success, innovation, and equality. And when we think about approaching a topic like um, climate change or creating change in the world, we begin with our values. And I'm incredibly proud of where Salesforce is on its own sustainability journey. Let me tell you a little bit of that context. So every day, um, every customer is on a carbon neutral cloud from Salesforce. We will hit 100% renewable energy only from new renewable energy that we or our suppliers on our behalf have helped bring to the grid. We have about 75% of our global real estate certified uh, to the highest levels of green building standards, including our office in Dublin. One, point, uh, one out of five employees is part of our green team that we call Earth Force. That's 10,000 people globally doing the many amazing things that add up to really big impact. And we've advanced our, our transparency to the investor community quite a long way, integrating environmental, social, and governance topics and metrics into our public filings. By the numbers, um, we can see that for us, data centers uh, present a very large source of our scope one and scope two emissions, along with business travel, um, offices, and employee commuting. We have programs in place to um, mitigate, reduce, avoid, and also um, bring renewable energy and carbon credits into the picture in order to achieve the goals that, that we showed earlier. And yet, at the scale that Salesforce operates, um, planet Earth will not notice. We, I, at the same time that I'm so proud of where we are on our own journey, we know that we need to take that um, opportunity provided by um, the great work that we've done over many years and find ways to catalyze systemic change. What we think about is, beginning with walking the walk. This is what provides any stakeholder from an individual to a country to a company the credibility in order to have an expert point of view on a topic like climate change. But it has to continue on from there given the scale of what we are trying to do. We need to walk the walk to a point where we can build a movement, inspiring others and showing them how to follow alongside us and then use that movement to create systemic change at the scale that planet Earth might actually notice. And 
the scale that planet Earth might actually notice is about 10,000 times bigger than Salesforce's own emissions. That's, that's how much bigger that domino is at the end of the chain that we're trying to kick off. We stand upon a foundation of excellence given uh, the great work that we've done over years, but then we look to stakeholders around us in order to drive that systemic change. Our customers, our suppliers, governments, and the investor community. And over the next few minutes, I'll zoom in on each of those stakeholder groups and tell you a little bit more about what we're doing with each of those. So the investor community, one of the biggest levers we have around us, if Salesforce can have even a small influence over reallocating capital flows, we can create big change for climate action. Um, we were proud to see Larry Fink and BlackRock step forward um, and really underscore the importance of businesses standing for something and improving the state of the world, and also the importance of the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures, TCFD framework, as a way to make sure stakeholders around businesses understand the trusted metrics that show whether a company is taking action or not. Our CFO, Mark Hawkins here, who you see in the center of the photo at the New York Stock Exchange, covering up my own face right behind his elbow, uh, is, is a, a great champion inside of Salesforce and has spurred us on the journey of making sure that our environmental data is investor grade and able to, and allows us to be a leader in environmental, social, and governance reporting. One of the ways we do that is with the Salesforce platform. Earlier this year, we launched Salesforce Sustainability Cloud. It's a platform for any of our customers or anybody who is not yet a customer to use the tools that have been built by Salesforce over 20 years that we've brought into a purposeful product that takes, that takes the form of allowing customers to take climate action. Um, it's really focused on two things. One is the annual greenhouse gas footprinting process. You can see that depicted in the large screen here on this image. What we've created is a very organized, single point of record, single source of truth for, for any stakeholder in a business to bring their environmental data to a place of trust. And then we've coupled that with analytics and data visualization, which you see on the mobile device here, that allows the executive audiences within a company who want to take climate action, allows them to have the data that they need and that they expect in order to take action. One of the ways that a company can take action is to invest in and focus on nature-based solutions. So let me tell you a little bit about that. Earlier this year, around the same time we launched Sustainability Cloud, Salesforce helped the World Economic Forum stand up 1T.org, an initiative that hopes to bring together all of the many stakeholders around the world who are focused on nature-based solutions and bringing um, greater, greater focus to tree conservation, restoration, and tree planting, an incredible and important part of the climate action portfolio. And upon that launch, we also made our own corporate commitment, which is to see 100 million trees um, planted, restored, conserved over the next decade. I mentioned our supply chain as well, as one of the great sources of leverage for change around Salesforce. We have a 1.5 degree approved science-based target from the science-based target initiative. And one of the components of that target is a scope three supply chain engagement goal that says suppliers representing 60% of our supplier-based emissions will set science-based targets of their own by 2024. To me, that sort of um, chain reaction set off by us and other companies alongside us who are looking to their supply chains to try to motivate them 
to create science-based targets is one of the greatest sources of inspiration in the climate corporate climate movement right now. We are um, day by day seeing more companies committing to and setting science-based targets. And as that coalition grows, the ability to influence supply chain members collectively grows with it. And day by day, we're seeing more and more momentum behind that initiative. And Salesforce hopes um, to the extent we can to help push that movement forward and help others along their journey. Another pillar of achieving that 10,000 X leveraged influence for climate action is in government affairs and public policy. Um, and when we think about our government affairs, public policy priorities regarding climate action, they come in three forms. One is reducing greenhouse gas emissions broadly. The next is decreasing the carbon intensity of the grids where we operate and the third is increasing market access to clean and renewable energy. And we've taken what, what um, is a very values-driven, values-oriented company in Salesforce and worked in close partnership with our government affairs team, both in the United States and internationally, in order to try to lend our voice and lend our support to the, the initiatives that can achieve these goals. And as we zoom in on Europe, we've, we've made a, a bunch of uh, good progress and good advances recently as well. Um, we joined the CLG recently, I'm quite proud of that. Um, we hosted Mark Carney um, uh, in a dialogue with, um, with the Salesforce employees recently as well. And I'm proud to say Salesforce with about 160, 150 other companies back the largest ever UN CEO led um, effort to request that the build back better um, components of stimulus recovery take place in the EU and globally. What's ahead for Salesforce? Um, just a little bit of a preview of some of the things we've committed to or are working on as we zoom, as we look forward. Um, again, this goal to see 100 million trees conserved or restored over the next decade, new commitments within our real estate, continuing to lead the geographies where we operate to a one and a half degree future, um, focusing in on water as well with our improved water leadership commitment under the We Mean Business Protocol, a 1.5 degree science-based target that we mentioned, including a supply chain component, uh, trying to bring others along with us on that journey. Focusing on clean and renewable energy, we expect that we will hit 100% renewable energy in FY22, again, from new renewable energy that we are able to bring to the grid. And I think one of the most interesting things is, again, Salesforce Sustainability Cloud, because in this climate emergency, every stakeholder can focus on what they do best for climate action. That happens at the individual level. We need artists to make art for climate action. We need lawyers to um, file lawsuits for climate action. And we need companies to, uh, to tether their unique core competency to climate action. For Salesforce, that is digital tools that help our customers transform their business. We've done that successfully through macro changes like the move to mobile, social, cloud, IoT, AI, and with Salesforce Sustainability Cloud, we can deliver digital tools to help your company, your organization transform in the face of climate action. And so that one to me is a place where our 150,000 plus uh, customers can find their own superpower for addressing climate change. And I'm really excited to see what happens there. So thank you for allowing me a few minutes to share some of the context um, and our point of view and our progress where we are headed here at Salesforce. I'm thrilled to be with you this, this afternoon and look forward to the discussion ahead. 
Well, thank you uh, very much, Patrick, for that um, stimulating, um, inspiring, indeed, uh, presentation. Um, uh, just maybe just to, to get the ball rolling, if I may, and um, and without wishing to be overtly political uh, in any way, not inviting you to be so. Uh, but I mean, clearly, uh, you are determined to be in the vanguard of, of uh, as a company uh, of sustainability and achieving the ambitious goals that you you, you outlined there. Um, I suppose two questions. One is, what would actually prevent you from doing so? What are the huge obstacles in your way? And the second one, where it maybe gets a little bit more political, is uh, how frustrating is it that perhaps at federal level in the United States that, you know, there's a disalignment or a non-alignment between maybe the kind of ambition that you're articulating there and uh, perhaps the, the view at, at federal level? Great. Thank you. Yeah, you know, in terms of, in terms of obstacles, um, I think one of the biggest one of the biggest challenges is trying to reconcile the urgency of climate change. You see something like 15% global annual emissions declines. Um, no amount of corporate incremental sustainability progress is going to deliver that. Even if we snapped our fingers and every company in the world was focused and motivated on taking their own steps forward bit by bit. So over, over the past few decades, that more incremental focus on sustainability has been extremely relevant. But now, given how much change we need and how fast, the, the challenge that we face is trying to take, a, take what we have learned and use that to try to catalyze bigger, more systemic change as quickly as possible. And I think for, for those in my position in corporate sustainability, that mindset shift of trying to, to look for bigger opportunities that can deliver impact far, far bigger than the four walls of the company is a new, um, more difficult, more challenging challenge, more challenging um, set of strategies with less direct control where it's much more about influencing others and and so i think i think the barrier is really trying to reconcile what a given corporate sustainability program can do with the demands of of the planet and then if i think about the the us context and the federal context it, the there is some some silver lining here you know the the same day that the federal government here announced that we would be withdrawing from the paris agreement hundreds of US businesses and now a movement that's thousands of stakeholders strong stepped in to say that we will uphold the ideals of the Paris Agreement. And so my, my sincere hope is that what we've seen is a, 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 um, a surge of state and local. We certainly have seen that. A surge of individual and corporate action that will in the end when we look back really have provided a boost um you know in, in terms of awakening stakeholders who need to take action here thank you patrick uh, maybe just a related question that's just come in um at least in part uh from a colleague a former colleague of mine david dunahu who of course was our ambassador at the, uh, the united nations and very much instrumental in in all the climate change uh, achievements uh, there over the last uh, the period of his, his term as ambassador he says uh, congratulations to Salesforce for its commitment and leadership on SDG, climate uh, and ESG. Uh, he says, some fear that the huge economic impact or shock of COVID will halt the momentum um, towards a sustainable world. Others see the SDGs as more relevant than ever and say, quote mm -hmm. unquote, building back must be based on them. Uh, where do you stand? Yeah, uh, it's a great question, and I, I imagine this is top of mind for many. So we might spend a little bit of time here on the intersection, you know, between between COVID and corporate sustainability. Um, let me, given given that we might have a few passes at it, let me let me first begin by maybe speaking to it at the highest level. Um, there are there are some great and helpful parallels between the COVID nineteen health crisis and the climate crisis. For example, globally, collectively, all of us, each of us is getting a crash course in system dynamics. The ideas of um, that, that in the case of COVID, actions today may take a couple of weeks 
before we start to see the impact. And in the case of climate change, actions today, what we do and do not do, might take a couple of years or a couple of decades to come to fruition. Um, a, a crash course in, in understanding the science, uh, exponential curves, trusting experts. And so that, I think, as we look forward, will provide this global collective capability for understanding a complex system with delays embedded within it. And I think that's quite a good thing. We're also seeing front and center just how interconnected we are. You know, think back to that image of, of the blue marble um, sitting there in space. Um, we know just how interdependent we are. And in the case of a global pandemic, that any one stakeholder's success relies on the success of the stakeholders around them. And certainly that is no, you know, that is truer than ever with the case of climate change, one global atmosphere. And, and absolutely with climate change, the unfortunate situation that those with the least usually are the ones who suffer the most. Um, so the net of it, I think, is these lessons learned that will help us in, in, in addressing the SDGs and in addressing climate action long term. We, we need to, uh, and we have in front of us, a multi-year, multi-decade um, adventure ahead to conquer these goals and to create a prosperous future. And what I hope is that the COVID-19 circumstances, although tragic and unwanted, have provided us with some really valuable lessons that will stick with us um, in terms of our, our sort of global collective action capability over the long term. Now, I think the other, the other thing to think about here is um, some strategies need to be accelerated, some strategies need to be decelerated in the, in the face of COVID-19. Um, the, back, in the, back at the um, launch of the UN emissions gap assessment last October or November, one of the, one of the lines that um, stood out to be most was, in order to achieve a one and a half degree future, we need rapid, far reaching, and unprecedented changes in every aspect of society. That's from about a year ago, back in October, before COVID-19 hit. And now, unexpectedly and tragically, we are seeing rapid, far-reaching, and unprecedented changes in every aspect of society. And we need to make the most of this moment of crisis and think about it as an opportunity to reorient and indeed to build back better. This is exactly um, the kind of change that we need to see. We just need to make sure we, we intervene and make sure that we don't build back the same, but build back in a direction that we want. That's excellent. So building back better is really what, uh, what, what may, out of this current tragedy, out of this current crisis, there is at least an opportunity to do that and to, to potentially achieve that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Patrick, yeah. So one, just a question here from Patrick um, Paul Walsh, who's the director of UCD, University College Dublin, one of our the biggest universities here in, in, in Ireland, Centre for Sustainable Development Studies. He says, excellent talk, talk. He says, is the Salesforce uh, sustainability cloud only for the corporate only for corporate operations he says in theory a tracker on uh, consumer expenditure on government or government spending on government spending would also induce the systemic changes outlined yeah uh, great question and thank you um, I'll tell you a little bit about the origin story for Salesforce sustainability cloud um, as a way to answer that one so um, once a year a company does its greenhouse gas accounting. And um, it is about as boring as it gets, in my opinion. It's the equivalent of doing corporate taxes, um, except instead of having a tax expert do it, usually the corporate sustainability team assigns it to the newest person on the team because it is um, really equivalent to looking in the rear view mirror and looking at what has transpired rather than looking forward and trying to change the future. And anybody who gets into corporate sustainability wants to look to the future and change things and does not want to be um, doing the paperwork to understand what transpired in the past. 
for Salesforce, even up to a few years ago, it took us six months to do that process, gathering utility bills and data from the different parts of our operations, applying emissions factors, stitching all that together and coming up with the metrics that we need. We set out to do that process better, inspired by our CFO, who told us that we needed to make our environmental data look a lot more like our financial data. And so we, we looked around at all different tools to do it, and the Salesforce technology platform emerged as the right solution. What we have with the Salesforce platform is equivalent to the building blocks, the Lego pieces, um, in order to assemble new capability. And those Lego pieces have been built over 20 years of R&D and product development for sales cloud, service cloud, marketing cloud, and the other tools that you all know so, so well um, from the Salesforce um, portfolio. We brought those tools together, and in the very first time we used Salesforce Sustainability Cloud internally, it took that six month process down to six weeks, and the important change there, beyond the time back to looking to the future, was that we were able to um, gather the data in time to place it into our 10K, the, the annual SEC public filing for the company, and have um, an integration of our environmental data with our financial data. Now, um, I, I share that anecdote because although it was built and is currently directed at the corporate sustainability user, um, the flexibility of that Salesforce platform is tremendous. And what we have in the most generic sense is a tool that allows any stakeholder to take a, a trusted data through the process of gathering it, analyzing it, creating feedback on it, getting it internally reviewed, externally reviewed, and to a place of the utmost trust and quality. So if we think about taking that tool that's that capability that's currently focused on the corporate customer, adapting it to things other than carbon emissions or adapting it to the needs of a city government um, is actually quite easy thanks to the flexibility of the Salesforce platform. Okay, very good. Just uh, as a matter of interest, uh, Patrick, um, um, in, in driving this ambition of, of Salesforce um, at the corporate level, are you reflecting, um, I suppose, the ambition? Um, uh, where, where is the ambition coming from? Is it coming from within Salesforce, or is it your customers and shareholders who are driving this ambition, or is it a combination of both? Mm, yeah, that's a great question. Um, 20 years ago, um, Salesforce was founded on the, on the idea of being a different kind of company. And one of the ways that that took place was integrating philanthropy into the business from day one. Um, we started with the 111 model, where 1% 1 of product, 1% of equity, and 1% of employee time would go to nonprofit causes around the world. And I mention that because what that has done is create a culture in the company that truly understands business is the greatest platform for change. And so it has started from the very top down, from day one to today. And, and as I, in my work within the company, meet new stakeholders across the business and come to them um, looking for ways to improve the state of the world, every single day I am blown away by how consistently that feeling and those values are shared with the employees at Salesforce. So I, I would say it starts there for sure, but all the while we are seeing so many other stakeholders highly motivated to see business achieve um, great positive impact in the world. The employees that are coming to Salesforce, especially younger employees, we know they are highly motivated to work for mission-driven companies. The investor community, we know, is highly motivated to see greater environmental, social, and governance data and certainly in environmental, social, and governance performance come out of the companies that they are investing in. Our communities, 
um, across the board, stakeholders are recognizing that values create value and that um, there is something really to be said for doing business with values aligned stakeholders and companies. And, and how typical would that be, uh, Patrick? I mean, in the, say, the California ecosystem, I suppose, you know, what Salesforce is doing would be, um, there'd, be there'd be many other companies seeking to uh, adapt, uh, adopt uh, leadership positions uh, on, the, on, 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 the, on these issues. Uh, but, I mean, how universal is this kind of uh, sentiment or this kind of um, ambition within the American business ecosystem? I mean, I know you're a global company, but obviously uh, right. California tends to give leadership on so many things. Uh, how far ahead of you are, are you from the rest of your, your cohort, as it were, in other states in the United States? Right. Um, we, are, we are right there alongside so many other leading companies. Uh, it's, it's one of the greatest sources of inspiration um, in my line of work. You know, when I connect with a peer at a different company, um, in a lot of ways, we consider ourselves on the same team, trying to achieve the same sorts of objectives to improve the state of the world. And I think, you know, you're pointing out that definitely we see West Coast US and technology companies quite a lot taking, taking the lead. We've seen just this week, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon stepping forward with new climate leadership um, announcements and it's, it's, in, it's, it's just so inspiring. Um, and we're also seeing leaders from other sectors as well. You've got, of course, you know, Patagonia and VF Corporation, um, Mars and Danon and, uh, you know, so many, so many companies that are um, leading that it's, it's not just about West Coast or tech sector. It is really um, the, the leading companies who know that values and a focus on values, a focus on stakeholders, um, creates value for the company. Okay, here's a question from Alistair McMenamin from Zurich Insurance. He says, I love the idea about how Salesforce has mobilized an internal green team. He wants to know, can you please share more about this? Sure. I love the green it. team is the Irish team, is it? Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. The, the Irish, the Irish Earth Force chapter is is double. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we we call it Earth Force, and the way we've done it is um, really. I'll, I'll describe a little bit of the governance um, in, in case that's helpful in in in, a, in the ideas of trying to stand one of these up. Um, the way it takes shape is it's local chapters within each major office for Salesforce. And we actually also have an EarthForce chapter for all of our remote workers that we call EarthForce at home. Um, and those chapters are more or less autonomous self-governing. We have, we have elections, um, people take positions of leadership in those local chapters. And then we have some degree of global oversight um, Julie Morad, who, who is a fantastic member of our team and, and based in London, helps with some of that global oversight. And what that takes the form of is really just trying to achieve some sort of consistency across those different chapters. So tangible examples of things like in a particular month, there may be a theme that, that each of the chapters tries to engage upon. And th those chapters themselves will do thing, everything from bring in speakers, to host a, a movie, speak, movie screening, um, volunteer events. All of those um, require the ability to be in person in gatherings. So some of that I'm sure is on hold. We've pivoted a lot to um, digital education and engagement, um, but, but hopefully that helps uh, with the, the colleague from, from Zurich Insurance to think about how to inspire. Very good. Uh, just a second, another question here from, um, from Durable O'Brien from Airgrid. She says, um, really great presentation, of course. She says, Salesforce really seems to have embedded sustainability across every aspect of its business. I'm interested in finding out how difficult or easy it has been to engage on sustainability across the supply chain. Does Salesforce put any supports in place to assist suppliers along the sustainability journey? Yeah, interesting. Um, definitely. So, you know, part one, uh, 
absolutely what, what we set out to do is embed sustainability throughout the business. And I mentioned the, the benefits of a really focused culture on creating positive impact. That's certainly helped us do that. We have stakeholders around the business who we work with as trusted partners in order to enact the change that, that we're looking for. Some of those stakeholders sit within uh, the supply chain team. And when it comes to supplier engagement, we've got uh, a few different ways that we do it. And it depends a little bit on who the supplier is, um, what sort of product, and what the relationship is with them. But what we aim to do is help all of them achieve the next steps on their sustainability journey by sharing with them what we have done and, and, and the lessons we have learned, giving them some of the tools that they need in order to gather um, and communicate the data back to us. So one example is over the, over quarter, the first quarter um, and, and into the second. So over the past few months, um, we've held webinars to talk about supply chain collaboration and supply chain engagement um, with other peer companies in hopes of spurring them along their journey. Some of the greatest supply chain successes we've had actually come in our real estate group. Um, we know um, employees are more productive, healthier, happier in built environments with a high degree of health and wellness, healthy materials, environmental sustainability. And so we've provided scorecards and toolkits to the vendors that, that, um, that we work with for building out our office spaces to help guide them on their own journey of product improvement to make sure that what they offer to us meets our needs and, and advances both of us forward on our sustainability journey. Good. Um, a lot of the, the things we're talking about are issues, obviously, which are a major preoccupation in the in the in the first world, if I may describe it as such, and you know, in the world of uh, that that we inhabit. What is uh, Salesforce's uh, perspective or kind of role does it see itself playing in the developing world? I mean, uh, over and beyond the kind of the developed world that, that is California, that is uh, the Europe that we, we inhabit. I mean, there's a whole world out there, obviously, which is full of challenges on, uh, in relation to development. Where does Salesforce come into all of that or what level of ambition do you have in that field? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think it's, it's important to begin the answer with the fact that climate change in particular has been um, created so much by the more developed economies and the worst impacts are going to be felt and are being felt even today by the developing economies of the world. There's, there's a deep obligation that I feel for us to take action on behalf of others. Um, when it comes to our, our global operations, we're, we are, as you say, a global company, operations all around the world, working with customers of every industry, every geography, every shape and size to help them transform their businesses. Our um, Salesforce.org team works with 40,000 NGOs scattered around the world, addressing various causes across um, the social and the environmental landscape. And those, those NGOs use Salesforce at significantly discounted or even free um, prices. So we, we create tremendous impact with our tools in the hands of the NGO community. And last but not least, when we think about our carbon credit, our carbon offset projects, we look globally to the locations where we can create environmental impact today and change people's lives today around the world to achieve, to help achieve some of our outcomes that we discussed, like providing carbon neutral cloud services to all of our customers, offsetting all of our business travel and employee commuting, um, and all of our scope one and scope two emissions. Here's a question from uh, Nancy O'Neill, who is uh, one of our colleagues in the Institute. She says, um, what behaviors are Salesforce employees encouraged uh, to undertake at an individual level? So we've gone from the global now to very personal, very individual level yeah. in their day-to-day -day work. We, you mentioned business travel and staff commuting. 
uh, two contributors you mentioned as being responsible for some of Salesforce's emissions. Yeah, uh, you know, we have a we have a learning platform that we call Trailhead, and anybody on this on this call can can look for um, sustainability lessons on Trailhead, and some of those are focused on the sorts of individual actions that any employee can take, both related to their work life, but also on a more personal um, family life basis. We're also more and more focused on the home environment now, since so many of our employees are working more from home than ever before during these unique circumstances. You know, at the home, you've, you've got opportunities for energy efficiency um, and thinking about swapping out light bulbs for LEDs. I'm sure many of you are far advanced on that part of the journey. Um, one, of the, one of the ones that often is overlooked is our dietary choices. So reducing food waste and switching more and more to a plant-based diet is one of the biggest levers that any of us has on an individual basis in order to create environmental change. Yeah, and I know individual companies and, and maybe Salesforce themselves, although I haven't heard it, have announced kind of indefinite working from home arrangements, uh, maybe even over and beyond uh, COVID. Have you as a company adopted a policy yet or a position in terms of what the future is going to be in terms of the balance to be achieved between working from home and working from the, 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 the previous environment? You're right. Some, some companies have said sort of more of an indefinite stance. Um, we haven't set a, a firm policy any direction yet at Salesforce. Um, we, I know the team is looking very closely at what this new work might look like, what the new modes of work might look like, and without a doubt, it will be different than what it once was. I, I personally would anticipate more people working from home and remotely than we saw before. And from an environmental sustainability perspective, um, it's one of these places where the interventions should happen sooner rather than later. So we are looking at um, policies related to air travel in order to understand how we might do that differently when things resume back to, a, to, a, to some sort of new normal. I think employee commuting too is a very important one. Um, we know that mass transit is definitely the most environmentally friendly, safest, most economical way to get to and from um, the work and home, home office. However, in the face of a global pandemic, I can imagine some rebound where people may be a little bit reserved about stepping back onto a bus or a train with other, with other people. Um, so this is a moment where we need to make sure we get those mass transit modes of transportation right and make sure they are safe, but also communicate the benefits and the safety of those modes of transportation. It's a great time to think about um, re-greening cities and making them more walkable and more cyclable for commuters um, as we go forward. So those are the sorts of intervention moments that this window of opportunity has created for us to not just go back to what it once was, to certainly not go back to something that's worse than one, what it once was, but to try to set in place the structures that will make us happier, healthier, and more vibrant. Excellent. Um, just a question here from Aoife McQuillan, who's, um, I think she's from our Department of Ministry of Transport here. Uh, in Dublin, she said, thanks for the presentation. She says, in terms of tripartite understanding of sustainable, sustainable development, what do you think are the key messages to focus on in moving the understanding of sustainable development away uh, from it being a purely environmental construct, especially in terms of public policy development? That's maybe mm. quite a big question. Yeah, thanks, Eva. Uh, you know, I think we have a chance here to communicate the interconnectedness of all of the um, sustainable development goals and the link between environment, social, and economy. A, a healthy economy can only rest on a healthy society, and a healthy society can only rest upon a healthy environment. And we're, we are seeing that interconnectedness in the 
very stark change between what, what things looked like globally last April versus what they looked like globally this April. And I think there's a tremendous opportunity to use that contrast in order to help people understand just how interconnected all of this is. With a health crisis, we have an economic slowdown. With an economic slowdown, we have cleaner air, cleaner water, birds returning to the cities that you can hear. And um, certainly the environmental benefits of the economic slowdown um, are, are only so good as to point out that the economy is disconnected from our environmental outcomes right now. And we need to realign economic and environmental in a way, and social, of course, in a way that advances in any one of these areas, advances the other as well. Okay, maybe just uh, coming towards the end here now, Patrick, um, and just maybe if I could just bring it back maybe to the times that are in it in the United States and, and, and uh, without again uh, wishing to invite you into kind of a fractious uh, political terrain or anything like that. But obviously you, you're in the midst of an election campaign now, um, you know, uh, what was destined to be kind of a, uh, a, a heavily fought campaign. Um, it, the issues that we're talking about here, I mean, to what extent would you ever anticipate that they will be uh, would be issues within the campaign itself, uh, will be issues that will differentiate between the candidates, uh, and uh, and um, and um, you know and and whether whether they're uh, uh, likely to get any profile uh, as a consequence, uh, you know, in the course of the campaign, mm -hmm. and, as, and as part of the future uh, administration, for example, should there be change? Yeah, uh, good question. I think one really one bright spot here. Is, is how much we are seeing climate show up in the US polling as an issue that really matters to a lot of voters. So I would predict that it is absolutely a component of the, elec the elections that we have ahead over the next few months, differentiating candidates, of course, the, the presidential, but also all of the many other state and local elections that'll be taking place over the next four months or so here in the United States. Um, the, the, the values and the objectives of creating a healthier, um, at more economically prosperous future for citizens of the United States and their children um, should be, and I hope is, something we can completely all agree upon um, and my, my sincere hope would be that we are entering into a, a phase where climate action, sustainability, broadly focusing on equality and human health and the environment really are what motivate a lot of voters going to the polls, especially given um, all of the chances they've had to see that things have been off track over the last um, time here and try to try to see them all um, re-motivated to really vote and and use the power of the vote to create the future that we want and that we all share well on that note uh, patrick i think we're going to draw uh, proceedings to an end we're just coming up on the, on the half hour and um we're, we're spot on time and um uh, in our usual efficient way at the iiea uh, but just to say uh, thank you, thank you for sharing those inspirational thoughts with with us, not just in relation to uh, what Salesforce itself is doing, as as, as but more broadly in terms of the, the global the global context, presenting the global global co context, the global uh, challenges. And for us in Ireland, it's it's I suppose it's very reassuring to know that there is a good Irish man in charge of such a green agenda <laughs> in California. It's something where we're, we're deeply mindful of that, of course, uh, the Irish are everywhere, uh, not least in Salesforce. And secondly, just to, uh, you know, to thank you for, obviously, to, to, to wish you well in, the, in your endeavor. Uh, 15 years ago, I'm sure a job like this didn't quite exist. I'm not even sure 10 years ago it existed. So bringing it from where it was then, a very low base, to the level of, of ambition that you now represent is something that's very, very uh, encouraging. And we commend it. I salute you, along with every other uh, individual and corporate out there who is seeking to achieve the same aims. Oh, well, thank you so much. We, I truly hope this was helpful to those who were able to attend. Um, I would love to use this as a springboard for greater conversation and collaboration. We have a lot of work ahead of us. I'm highly motivated to do that. 
and none of us can do it alone. Uh, the, the only thing of leadership here is leadership in terms of collaboration. There, there will not be any single leader, um, just a bunch of people like me and a bunch of companies like Salesforce who are hoping to um, follow their values and improve the state of the world. Thank you very much, Patrick. And we'd like to invite you back on some future occasion when maybe you can tell us uh, the progress that's been made in the meantime. So thank you very much okay. and good morning to you in California. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank, thank you all you very so much, much indeed. And we'll see you on the next IIE webinar. Thank you very much.